Thank you very much indeed. And can I say it's an absolute joy to be back with you again this morning in a rather drich Dundee. The sun is shining in South Yorkshire. But it's really good to be here. Good to see all of you. And thank you so much for the warm, warm welcome. And again, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share fellowship with you around the Lord's table earlier this morning. Now, today we're looking at uh, Ecclesiastes in chapter 5, the second half of chapter 5. We're going to read a verse or two here and then go through to the end of the sixth chapter. I'm not sure who makes up the schedule for the talks uh, Sunday morning by Sunday morning, but I seem to get landed with an awful lot to do right here today. But hopefully by lunchtime we'll get through it and then you'll be back in good time for four o'clock this afternoon, where the focus this afternoon actually is on worship and you and I standing in awe of God. So now you found Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning there at verse 8. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 8. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. This too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs. And what does he gain, since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him. For this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions, and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot, and be happy in his work. This is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Then if you go way down to the end of chapter 6, to verse 12. For who knows what is good for a man in life? During the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? And there we finish. And we pray God's special blessing on his word again this morning. Now I'm sure many of you have probably heard the old, old song. Money, money must be funny in a rich man world. Now some of us... I have to say, if a certain vintage remember that song, it was away back in 1976 by the Swedish pop group ABBA. That song went on to say, I'm not going to sing it, but it went on to say, I work all night, I work all day, to pay the bills I have to pay, and still there's never enough to see, a single penny left for me. You recognize those words? I think many of you do. Well, those lyrics, believe it or not, dear friends, are actually a running commentary on what the teacher is talking about in the section we're looking at in our study this morning. 
And so today the plan is, look at chapter 5, verse 8, wait until the end of verse 12 in the following chapter, chapter 6. And what we have here is some straight talk to the money mad. It's all about the influence of affluence. It tells us, quite frankly, what is learned about the use of money by Joe Public. And what he also discovered about the abuse of money by those whom we could say are members of the high finance brigade. You know, you often hear people saying, don't you? Wouldn't it be great to win the lottery? Think about it. Out of no more worries about money, I could sit back, really enjoy life, do all the things I've always wanted to do. Now, people in today's world, they live beside you and beside me. People dream even today about winning the football pools, don't they? I mean, they speculate on making a fortune on the horses, like the thousands who were there in Doncaster yesterday for the famous St. Ledger. Men and women across the board will often invest in stocks and shares in the hope that one day they will strike it lucky and make a quick buck or two. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have so much money you didn't know what to do with it? Well, that's what you might think. The teacher here in Ecclesiastes, he begs to differ. He doesn't say it quite like that at all. Actually, he insists that money doesn't make a person happy. And you know, friends, when you and I take a moment and seriously think about it, we know the writer here is absolutely dead right. And I think looking back in history, the classic example is the well-documented, indeed bizarre life of the American business magnate, a fellow called Howard Hughes. I mean, look at him. And you very quickly discover that there's no connection at all between a man who has phenomenal wealth and happiness. There's no link between the two. But you see, dear friends, human nature being what it is, you and I, we keep on dreaming. We're fairly slow learners. And so Mr. Teacher here in this wonderful book, he provides us with a kind of exposure on what money does. Now, if you wish you had more, listen to what I'm about to say. For when you take a look down there, first of all, at verse 8 and verse 9, there's one sentence which immediately springs to mind, a phrase that I'm sure all of us are fairly familiar with, and it is this, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Money talks, or so they tell us. Well, in the situation we have detailed right here in chapter 5, all it ever says to the poor man is goodbye. And that's not B-U-Y. That is B-Y-E. On the other hand, in the story, to those who were well-heeled and fairly well-to-do, it was seemed to buy them a greater degree of influence in the corridors of power. Uh, you see, oftentimes, it's not what you know. It's who we know. And a few dollars on the side can help us get where we want to get and perhaps even achieve what needs to be done. We think about corruption. We think about sleaze. We think of bribery. We think about under-the-counter transactions. It's a mindset that says, you scratch my back and I'll see you right. And my friend, these are the inevitable results of a money mad, a money-grabbing, a money-oriented culture. You see, where you've got men and women who are lining their own pockets, who are feathering their own nest, who are always looking after number one, do you know something? The moral impact on every community is staggering. You know why? Because it begins to weaken the whole fabric of society. It does. It actually tears the heart out of decent, ordinary people who were struggling to make ends meet. And the remarkable thing you have right here is that the teacher wrote down there in verse 8, 
Do not be surprised at such things. Now let's move on, shall we? Because in the next four verses, the teacher puts his finger on three things that wealth actually guarantees. Number one is found down there in verse 10. And it tells us that having a pile of money, what does it do? It will increase your appetite, but not your level of satisfaction. And you know, my friend, the fact of the matter is that whoever loves money, they never have enough. Isn't that true? They never have enough. They always want more and still more. And guess what? When they acquire that wee bit more, do you know what? They're still not content. You see, the baseline is the more we have, the more we want. It was a late duchess, a Windsor, who coined a famous phrase, one can never be too rich or too thin. The story is told about one of the Rockefellers of a bygone era when asked which million he most enjoyed making. Do you know what his reply was? The next one. The next one. And you see, what you have anticipated here is that grab all you can get syndrome. You see, the man who's penning these words, the teacher, he wasn't pontificating here from some remote outpost on the edge of Never Never Land. Far from it. This guy isn't talking out of the top of his head. No, no. He's actually voicing his own experience in the real world. He knows it's true. He sports a t-shirt. He's been there and he's done it. And so point number one is this. Having a pile of money increases your appetite but not your level of satisfaction. And then the second point we have right there is also found in verse 11 in chapter 5. Do you know what it tells me? A healthy bank balance will add to your list of friends, but not necessarily the money you have in your pocket. It will add to your list of friends, but not necessarily your income. I mean, it's the old story, isn't it? If you've got a few quid in your pocket, you'll have plenty of people around you who will help you spend it. Isn't that true? The prodigal son discovered that, didn't he? In Luke chapter 15. You see, friends, if you're willing to pick up the tab, there will always be men and women in today's world who will be there to take advantage of your generosity and your kindness and your hospitality and you know we read about such people elsewhere in scripture and they're described there as being no better than than hangers on even spongers these are people who will milk you for what they can get out of you and quite honestly they give you little or nothing in return such people will actually cost you at the end of the day a small fortune they're no better and parasites and sadly but the truth is if you didn't have it these people wouldn't be anywhere near you so a healthy bank balance will add to your list of friends but not necessarily your income and the third one is found down there in verse 12 where we quickly discover that loads of money increases your insomnia but not your contentment. Yeah, it will increase your insomnia, but not your contentment. And again, you've got to be amazed at what the writer is saying down there in verse 12. I mean, these are words that are sprinkled with candid honesty. This man is lucid and ever so clear in his thinking. And you see what he says? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Insomnia, sleepless nights. Well, the rich man doesn't have any financial worries to get uptight about. But what he does have are major concerns as to what is happening to his money. You see, on the one hand, the rich man, he has it made. 
but on the other hand, he wonders what it's making. This guy who's got a penny or two in the bank, he should be smiling all the time because this bloke is actually set up for life. But I can tell you, he doesn't appear to be laughing all the way to the bank, does he? Think about it like this. Interest rates, an economic downturn, market fluctuations, foreign investments. I mean, those are all buzzwords in a world of finance. Now, to many of us gathered here this morning who will be watching later on, to many of us, they may not mean very much at all. But I can tell you, if you're reading the Financial Times, they mean an awful lot. Oh, yes. Millions can be made or lost with the adjustment of every percentage point by the Bank of England or the Chancellor. And it's no wonder these rich men can't sleep on their bed at night. No wonder. And then you see what the teacher in his wisdom does. He throws a kind of a spanner in the works, doesn't he? When he talks about food. You see, it would appear there's another reason why. These guys are lying wide awake at night. You know what he's saying here? He says, the rich man has consumed far too much the night before. And his mindset, his philosophy is quite simple. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we diet. And so, when he retires for the evening, his stomach is talking back to him. As Tommy is letting him know, it didn't really appreciate what he's inflicted on it. His digestive system, what's it like? It's like a rumbling volcano. This high-flying financial whiz kid can't sleep for two reasons. Number one, he's too fat. And number two, he's too full. And that's what the teacher is hinting at very cleverly down there, isn't it? So a quick summary so far will highlight for us what we've discovered so far. More money, more people. More people, a lot more worries. More worries, less sleep. That's it in a nutshell. It's as simple as that, dear friends, for that's life as it really is. Now, it's good to have the things that money can buy. We enjoy them, we value them, we appreciate them, don't we? It's good to have the things that money can buy, provided, provided you don't lose the things that money can't buy. If you cast your eye down the page of chapter 5 to verse 13 to 17, we're introduced here to what he calls, quite colourfully, two grievous evils associated with the pursuit of wealth. And the first principle is, those who have clutched can very quickly crash. And the second principle is, those who live high, they often die hard. Now, what's the teacher doing? Well, the picture here is of two fabulously wealthy individuals. One person hoarded all his wealth and then ruined himself by becoming a miser. There was a biography published relatively recently of uh, the late Paul Getty, and it sums his life up with this rather terse statement that Paul Getty was a legend of luxury, lust, and loneliness. The other person we have here in chapter 5 in his biblical critique actually made some unsound investments. He ended up losing his wealth. This guy was right back where he started from. He had no estate to leave to his son when he left this world. His returns were nil. This old fellow, he spent the rest of his days in the darkness of discouragement, overwhelmed with a feeling of defeat. For him, his charm lifestyle had quite literally vanished overnight. Then you also read down there, don't you, the end of the chapter? Like every one of us, he brought nothing into this world at birth. And guess what? He took nothing out of it at death. There are no pockets in a shroud. 
This guy put a lot of money through his hands. He frittered away enormous sums over the years. But look what the Bible says. It hasn't done him much good. And so when it comes time for his number to be called at the end of life's road, this fellow faced a very lonely death and a terribly cold grave. He's gone the same way he came into this world. Guess what? Empty-handed. Empty-handed. But if you turn the page over, I love the way chapter 5 ends. Because we move away from the doom and the gloom of the money-mad crowd to a few bright rays of sunshine that shine in those who realize that their money is what? It's a gift from the Lord. And so in verses 15 down to verse 18, we've got three priceless benefits, which are yours and mine, if we handle our wealth the way God designed. And so we read down there, for example, in verse 18, that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of his life that God has given him. So if you and I live our lives the way God intended, we should live them. Guess what? We can find lots of pleasure and lots of joy in our many activities. But that can only happen in your life and mine if we refuse to commit ourselves to the pursuit of possessions. You know, the accumulation of wealth and the hoarding of resources doesn't actually lend itself to a life of enjoyment. It actually militates against us, doesn't it? And then you see what he says down there in verse 19. He says, we're introduced to a second blessing, which would indicate that a measure of job satisfaction in what we're doing right now. You could enjoy what you're doing, nine to five, as it were. Job satisfaction. You know, we can find fulfillment in the daily grind, whatever that may entail. And the key phrase that we have down there is in the middle of verse 19. It is to accept his lot. That's it. Accept his lot. That means that you and I will be happy with whatever our present position is. Hence the command away back in the book of Exodus, thou shalt not covet. You know, friends, the temptation is to always think there's something better down that road or there's maybe someone better around the next corner. The fact of the matter is, the grass is rarely greener on the other side of that fence. And so says the preacher man down here towards the end of chapter 5, enjoy it today. It may not be there tomorrow. And the third wonderful bonus is found in verse 20 where the teacher here is talking about people who were happy and content with whatever God has entrusted to them. And do you know when you and I come to a point in each of our lives, we have that deep inward peace. We have a sense of joy bubbling up in our hearts. You know why? Because whether we have much or whether we have little, it don't matter. We're focusing on the goodness of a faithful God to every one of us. And the people he's talking about at the end of chapter 5 are those who revel in God's kindness and in God's provision. Here are men and women like you and like me, hopefully, who are immensely thankful for everything. You see, to such people, he says it here, it doesn't really matter if there's nothing put by for a rainy day. It doesn't really matter. These kind of people are people who are happy to leave the rainy day in the hands of the Lord because God knows exactly what they need and when they need it. All because their God in chapter 5 is El Shaddai, the God who is enough. And so for the people at the end of the chapter, it is one day at a time. Anything else, 
Anything above that is a beautiful bonus. So we can draw the strands together, can't we, right here in chapter 5? We can say that if we focus more on the gifts than on the giver, what are we guilty of? We're guilty of idolatry. If we accept his gifts, but then complain about them, what are we guilty of? We're guilty of ingratitude. If we hoard his gifts and do not share them freely with others, what are we guilty of? Another eye. It's the eye of indulgence. But you know, friend, if you and I take a moment and yield to the will of God and use what God gives to every one of us for his glory and bless others in the process, guess what happens? We can enjoy life to the full and be satisfied. Now, when you cross over the chapter divide and go into chapter six, here's a chapter I reckon full of interest and intrigue. Now, having said that, there's quite a number of disturbing issues that are handled there as well. And I think it all boils down to a fairly simple, straightforward question for you and for me. Is life a dead-end street? Is life just a cul-de-sac? We go into it, but the question is, is there a way out of it? You know, take your own life and I take mine. There's so many things in your life and mine that we find hard to understand, isn't there? So much of what life throws in our direction doesn't seem at face value to make an awful lot of sense. So many events that come to your door and come to my door, they just seem to be shrouded in a cloak of mystery. We don't always see the reason why or the divine rationale behind it. So right here in chapter 6, you'll get your fill of it. Oh yeah? There are three more. Okay, three more. Number one is found down there in the first half dozen verses. And it speaks about people who have a lot when it comes to money, Yep, but who actually have very little when it comes to personal enjoyment and pleasure. And that's what he touched on ever so briefly in the previous chapter. In fact, that's what he alluded to way back in chapter 3 and in verse 19 that Matthew talked about last Sunday morning. You see, so far as the teacher is concerned, the basic principle is this. No one can truly enjoy the gifts of God apart from the God who gives the gifts. You see, friends, it's not the money that makes a difference in your life and mine. Do you know? It's God, a God who is rich in mercy. Now, take a look at chapter 6 and verse 2. I reckon chapter 6 verse 2 may describe a kind of a hypothetical situation. It, it may even be a vignette of someone personally known to the writer, or it may even be a self-portrait of the pen man himself. But look, friends, whoever it is, this person is financially secure. This individual can live comfortably on the interest without even touching the capital. But is there anyone drawback? They're not able to enjoy the benefits of their considerable fortune for one reason or another. Now, we are not told in the scriptures what the problem is. All we know is that someone else came along and acquired the estate. And the preacher's conclusion is one that echoes throughout the entire book. You've heard it before. You'll hear it again. This is meaningless. Yeah, it all seems so futile, so pointless, so empty, so stupid. And you know, friends, if there's a lesson to learn from this debacle, it would be simply this. Don't plan to begin life tomorrow. Start living for Jesus today. Now, there's no doubt in my mind, but verses 3 to verse 6 it's a kind of a scenario. It's actually plucked out of the top drawer of the author's overactive imagination. You see what he does there? He talks about a fella having a hundred kids 
and about the possibility of living for a couple of thousand years now. To put it very mildly, both are just OTT. Okay. But having said that, the preacher man in this book, he gets the point across ever so powerfully with the art of exaggeration. And his punchline is simply this. He says, look, folks, no matter how much you possess, if you don't have the ability to enjoy it, what's the point? Yeah. He says there's no real reason for living. In other words, you'd be far better off if you'd never been born in the first place. Not my words, his words. And you see his parting shot down there in verse 6. It's when he asks the pertinent question, do not all go to the same place. And my friend, that comes home to the heart, doesn't it? That touches your life and mine. It underlines the truth that it doesn't matter who we are today, rich man, poor man, or maybe somewhere in between. Guess what? We all end up six feet under. And is confronting the audience there with the certainty of death and of the emptiness of a life lived without God. If you have money, but don't have Jesus, you have nothing. Take a look at verse 7. In verse 7, we have a cameo here of a person with ambition. Some with loads to drive. The kind of person who can't put on the brakes, as it were. He just keeps going. If you get money, you'll get things done. It's that get up and go kind of individual. Somebody with flair and initiative. Someone willing to take his fair share of risks day after day. Do you know people like that in verse 7? These are guys who were often oozing with confidence. And they're happy to jet around the world with a passport to everywhere, to anywhere, because they want to achieve success, don't they? And then, take a look at verse 8. We're introduced to what I would call the old school tie syndrome. It's a kind of excellent education in the best public school that, guess what, money can buy. And people who have been there and done that, they've got the right contacts, don't they? Uh, it's through the infamous old boy network. We see evidence of that in high society, even in government circles. These people have a knack for knowing how to conduct themselves in a delicate and tricky situation. But they're not behind the door in pushing themselves forward either. Take a look at verse 9. He says there, better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. Now, you've probably heard the old saying, I'm sure. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You heard that saying? I'm sure you have. Fulfillment is always out of reach. It's just around the next corner. My friend, we need to stop dreaming about what we don't have and be content with what we do have. And the verdict of the preacher down here is exactly the same as you've heard before, meaningless. Meaningless. You may have everything. You may have done everything. You may have gone everywhere. But in the end, it spells nothing. Nothing. You see, friends, we can't begin to discover contentment until we face reality. And that's what you have down there in the final three verses of chapter 6 in Ecclesiastes. It's the reality that God is sovereign. He is the one who has staked his claim of ownership over all of creation. He's the one who rules and reigns on high. He's the one who knows all there is to know about you and about me. He's the one who is all-powerful, almighty. And before him, you and I fade into insignificance. We're like the proverbial grasshopper. See, God's the only one who can bring an eternal dimension to your life and to mine. You heard about that last Sunday. 
in chapter 3 and verse 11. He's the one who gives a sense of direction to your life and mine as we live it down here on planet Earth. He's the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings in the human heart. He's the only one who knows the end from the beginning. You and I can only see right now, today. But he can see tomorrow and the day beyond. And that's why the teacher down here at the end of the chapter poses a teaser. Who can tell him what will happen after, under the sun after he is gone? And how true it is, friends. Think about it. When things go wrong in your life and mine, what do we often do? We often take it out on the Lord, don't we? We often point the finger of blame in his direction. But the won't go away fact this morning is this. It doesn't matter what your situation or mine may be like. It doesn't even matter what our economic circumstances may be like. Guess what? With Jesus living within and our sin forgiven, we can really enjoy life to the full if we're trusting in him day after day. So the preacher tells us here, in this fairly lengthy section, he tells us in as many words, doesn't he? Don't build your life on money or things. He says, build your life on the solid foundation of the living God. For in the words of the Apostle Paul, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? And then lose his own soul. Or to quote the martyr Jim Elliot. Gave his life. In the Ecuadorian rainforest. He put it like this. As a young man. He is no fool. Who gives what he cannot keep. To gain what he cannot lose. Money ain't everything. But Jesus is. Amen.